Okay, this is homework for Chapter 2, Physics 102. It says a proton moves 2 centimeters parallel and in the direction of a uniform electric field of 200 newtons per coulomb. So it looks sort of like this. Electric field. And then you have this proton that's moving in this direction. All right, the force actually is in this direction because it's a positive particle and the force is in the same direction as the electric field. And then it also moves in the direction of that force. So the force and the displacement are both in that direction. And the first question just asks, uh, how much work is done? A, what is the work done? And we know that work is equal to the force times the displacement. When they're in the same direction, it's going to be a positive work. If they're in opposite directions, it's going to be a negative work. All right. Our force is equal to Q times E times D. And so I can put in my values here. I'll write them over here. It's uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The electric field, it says, is 200 newtons per coulomb. And my displacement is 2 centimeters, which is 0 0.02 meters, which gives me a work, a positive work, of 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now, uh, I also want to know, in part B, what change in the potential energy occurs. Well, the change in the potential energy is equal to the negative of the work. All right, you can think about this, that uh, if you do work on an object, you increase its kinetic energy. And if you think about the conservation energy, then your potential energy is going to decrease by that amount, uh, if that helps you to think about it in that way. So the change in potential energy is the negative work. And that's going to be negative 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So just the negative of what we had in part A. And then in part C, uh, we want to know what potential did difference did the proton move through? All right, well, the potential difference, delta V, is energy per charge. Volts are just how much energy do you have per unit charge. And that's just sort of a fundamental definition of what is potential. Potential or potential difference is the energy per charge. All right energy per charge. So that's just our energy is 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 joules divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That means that it moves through a potential of 4 volts. All right, a charged particle accelerated through a potential difference of 60 volts has its potential decreased by this amount. Calculate the charge of the particle. Let's see, and I have changed this, actually. Uh, this might not be changed in your book, but here, this should not say 2.42. It should say 2.88 times 10 to the minus 17 joules. All right, uh, and we want to calculate the charge on the particle. I know that my change in potential energy is equal to negative Q times delta V. Now, this sort of comes from our, uh, our standard definition of delta V is PE over Q, or negative PE over Q. Um, so I can calculate Q is equal to negative PE over delta V, which is going to be uh, negative of negative 2.88 times 10 to the minus 17 joules divided by delta V, which is 60 volts. And then that gives me a Q of 4.8 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. All right, 4.8. So it's a positive charge. Uh, and if we were to draw our field vectors, they would look like this. This is our electric field. This is our positive particle, and it's moving in this direction. All right, moving in that direction. It's a positive charge, so it follows the direction of the field lines.
Okay, find the electric potential one centimeter from a proton. What is the electric potential difference between two points that are one and two centimeters from a proton? Part A, and we can calculate the potential due to a point charge. It's just KQ over R, KQ over R. And at one centimeter, it's just going to be nine times 10 to the ninth. Uh, times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, it's in coulombs, divided by r, which is 1 centimeter, or 0 0.01 meters. And that works out to be 1.44 times 10 to the minus 7 volts. So the potential uh, at 1 centimeter from a proton is 1.44 times 10 to the minus 7. Now in part b, I want to know what is the potential difference going from uh, two points that are one and two centimeters from the proton. So V of two centimeters, this is one centimeter. V at two centimeters is nine times 10 to the ninth. And that's equal to 7.2 times 10 to the eighth minus 8 volts. And so my potential difference, which is going to be V2 minus V1, is going to be uh, 7.8 times 10 to the minus 8 minus 1.44 times 10 to the minus 7 volts is going to equal negative 7.2 times 10 to the minus 8 volts. So that's my change in potential. Now. Let's consider my positive charge here. I have a positive charge. My electric field lines are going to emanate outward. Per the rules that we, we talked about for drawing electric field lines. Um, and our, um, our particle is going from here to here. Out here, we have a small electric field, all right, and a low potential. All right, it has a low potential for motion, a low amount of energy per unit charge. Up here, closer to the charge at one centimeter, it has a big electric field and a big potential. It has more energy per unit charge. All right, so uh, out here, this is V2. This is V1, and so the V2 minus V1 is less than zero because V2 is smaller, as we found, than V1 because that was a small electric field uh, and a low potential. All right, find the electric potential taking zero at infinity at the upper right corner, the corner without a charge, or the right thing on this figure, and then repeat if the 2 is replaced with a negative 2. All right, so we're looking here. Uh, potential is a scalar quantity, so it's fairly simple to find the net potential. It's just the sum of kq over r. That is, we just want to add up the value kq over r for each of the three charges as measured from here. So let's see. Let's give these some, uh, some, value, some labels. I'll call that q1, q2, and q3. And so this is going to be KQ1 over R1 plus KQ2 over R2 plus KQ3 over R3. Putting in values for that, I get, I'm going to factor out the 9 times 10 to the ninth. And I have Q1, which is 6 times 10 to the minus 6. That's in coulombs over R1, which is 3 meters, plus Q2, which is 2 times 10 to the minus 6, 
or excuse me, actually, this isn't 3 meters for Q1. It's the distance from here to here, so that's 4 meters. And then for the 2 microcoulomb charge, the distance that we want to know is this distance. Uh, this is 3 meters, 4 meters, so this is 5 meters. Because it's a 3, 4, 5 triangle. That's a special triangle. Uh, and then Q3 is 4 times 10 to the minus 6. And as we said, this distance is 3 meters. All right, if we plug in those values, we find that the potential is... Nine times ten to the ninth times all of these. That's three point two times 10 to the minus 6 times 9 times 10 to the ninth, which is 2.9 times 10 to the fourth volts. So the voltage up here is 29,000 volts. Now, um, I'm not going to do this here. Well, no, actually I will. So for part B, we also want to repeat if the 2 microcoulomb charge is now minus 2 microcoulomb charge for part B, then V is going to look like this. We're going to have uh, 9 times 10 to the ninth times, uh, let's see, 6. That's 1.5. That's this value right here. Minus... four times ten to the minus seven. That's this value, but making it negative because now the charge is negative. Plus and that gives us Two point two times ten to the four. Or twenty two thousand volts. So if you have a negative charge where Q two is, you get a lower voltage because you basically just subtract that negative quantity. All right. Three charges are situated at corners of rectangles in this figure. How much energy is required to assemble these charges, assuming they come from a very far distance away? Now remember the work to assemble charges is equal to Q times delta V. And so we want to imagine if we have all three of these charges, we bring them in one at a time, how much work is required for each of them to bring in. So let's call this Q1, let's call this Q2, and then let's call this Q3. Now imagine that Q2 and Q3 are not there, and you bring in Q1 to where there are no other charges. I'm going to draw another little figure over here. So you bring in Q1 right here. The amount of work required to bring in Q1 is going to be Q1 times the change in potential experienced by Q1. But since there are no other charges, there is no change in potential. So this is going to be equal to Q1 times 0 volts. So work required to place this charge up here is going to be 0. Now, let's imagine that we bring in Q2. So we bring in Q2. We're putting it right here. All right, Q3 is not in the picture yet, and we want to figure out what is the work required to bring in Q2. And that's going to be Q2 times delta V. Now, in this case, the, the charge Q2 is coming into an electric field that's due to the charge Q1. So there is a change in potential. So we need to calculate what that change in potential is. Now, it's, uh, we can find that. Let's say Q2 is uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. 
and the potential The potential due to Q1 is going to be K times Q1, which is 6 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. That's Q1 up here, all over the distance, which is 3 meters. Putting in the value for K, then we find that work 2 is going to be 0 0.036 joules. All right, and now we bring in our third charge. We put our third charge right here. And we want to calculate the work to bring it in. And it's going to be Q3 times delta V. And that change in potential is due to the two charges that are already there, Q1 and Q2. So it's going to be Q3, which is 4 times 10 to the minus 6, times KQ1 over R1 plus KQ2 over R2. And when I put in those values, it looks like this. 4 times 10 to the minus 6. It's coulombs. That's the charge of Q3. I'm going to go ahead and factor out the 9 times 10 to the 9th. And then Q1 is 6 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs divided by R1. R1 is the distance from Q3 to Q1. That's this distance, which is 5 meters. Plus... 2 times 10 to the minus 6. This is Q2. All over that distance, which is 4 meters. Okay, and then that tells me the work for W3, which is 0.061. So, the work required to assemble the first charge is 0 joules. To bring in the second charge is a little bit more, 0.036. And then to bring in the third charge is 0.061. So my total work equals 0 plus 0.036 plus 0.061, which is equal to 0 0.097 joules. How much charge is on each plate of a 4 microfarad capacitor when it is connected to a 12 volt battery? If the same capacitor is connected to a 1.5 volt battery, what charge is stored? All right, well, with capacitors, we know that the charge on the capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the voltage. The higher the capacitance, the more charge you can store. The higher the voltage, the more charge that you store. All right, so uh, that's a basic rule with capacitors. So this is a pretty straightforward problem. Q is equal to CV. Q is equal to 4 times 10 to the minus 6 farads times 12 volts. That gives me 48 times 10 to the minus 6 uh, coulombs. Uh, you would actually get it as, what, 4.8 times 10 to the minus 7. Excuse me, 4.8 times 10 to the minus 5. Uh, but this is 48 microcoulombs. And then in part B, uh, if the same capacitor is connected to a 1.5 volt battery, what charge is stored? Same problem, really, just a different voltage. 4 times 10 to the minus 6 farads times 1.5 volts. That gives us uh, 6 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs, which is 6 microcoulombs. So you see I have a, a lower voltage. In this case, uh, let's see, it's lower by a factor of 8. That is, look, I can draw a ratio of 12 over 1.5 is equal to 48 over 6. It's a linear relationship. So if you lower the voltage, the charge lowers by the same amount. All right, a 60 times 10 to the minus 15 farad capacitor has a plate area of that given. Determine the plate separation. Assume a parallel plate configuration. So uh, in capacitors, our capacitance is proportional to the area and the displacement. And it's proportional to the area. Like if you have a 
a parallel plate capacitor. If you increase the area of the plates, it increases the capacitance. So if this goes up, this goes up. If you increase the separation of the plates, the capacitance goes down. So if this goes up, this goes down. So we derive this expression. C is equal to epsilon naught A over D. Um, and then I just want to know what is the capacitance. And C is equal to, uh, let's see, 60 times 10 to the minus 15 farads. The area is 21.0 times 10 to the minus 12 meters squared. And, uh, and that's all. Epsilon naught, I don't have that right off, I think. So yeah, I don't have it. I, gosh, I, I'm sort of guessing. If this is wrong, I'll come back later. But I think it's 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. I forget the units on it, but that, that number sort of sticks in my head for some reason. So let's just go with that. If it's not correct, I'll, I'll make a note of it later. All right, so uh, I'm looking for D. I want to know the plate separation. So I solve this right here for D. And D is going to be epsilon naught A over C. Epsilon naught A over C. So putting in those numbers, I get 3.1 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. So that's the distance between the plates. And then it's asking just how many atoms can fit across that. So I just divide this by the diameter of an atom, which is 10 to the minus 10. And I get that it's about 31 atoms across. So in this space, you could fit 31 atoms across. If this is number 8. It says a series circuit consists of a 0.05 and a 0.1 microfarad capacitor and a 400 volt battery. We want to find the charge on each of the capacitors. Let's first just draw our circuit, 400 volt battery. There's our 0.05. There's our 0.1. They are in series, that means they're one after the other, 0 0.05, 0 0.1 microfarads, it's 400 volts. We first need to create an equivalent capacitor or an equivalent circuit. That is, if I replace these two capacitors with a single capacitor, what is its value? And the equivalent capacitance for capacitors in series is the inverse of the sum of the inverses, like this. It's one over, one over, 0.05 plus 1 over 0.1, which is equal to 0 0.033 microfarads. Okay, that's the equivalent capacitance, 0 0.033. And now we want to know what is the charge on each of these two capacitors. All right, this is 400 volts. Capacitors in series have the same charge. That's one of our basic rules for capacitor circuits. So the charge that is on this capacitor, the equivalent capacitor, is the same as the charge on these two capacitors. So I know that Q is equal to CV. That tells me that on that equivalent capacitor, I have 13.3 microcoulombs. So that is my answer. 13.3 microcoulombs on this capacitor and also on this one and this one. The two capacitors have the same charge because they're in series. Now, what if they're in parallel? Let's just redraw this. To be in parallel looks like this. You can tell that two electronic devices are in parallel because you have a breakpoint like here, and you have two separate branches. All right, 
and those devices are going to be on separate branches and then those two branches will come back together over here. Uh, it's fairly obvious in this case that they're in parallel, but sometimes your circuits, it won't be so obvious. All right, so I have these two in parallel, capacitors in parallel have the same voltage. Capacitors in parallel have the same voltage. So if I have 400 volts here, I also have 400 volts here and 400 volts here. All right. I also know the capacitance. This is 0.05 microfarads and this is 0.1 microfarads. So Q of the 0.05 is equal to C times V. That's 0.05 microfarads times 400 volts which gives me uh, 20 microcoulombs and then Q for the 0.1 microfarad capacitor is going to be 0.1 microfarads times 400 volts which is equal to 40 microcoulombs. So these are our answers for part B. Number nine, a parallel plate capacitor has two square centimeter plates that are separated by five millimeters with air between them. If a 12 volt battery is connected to this capacitor, how much energy does it store? Okay, um, look up a value right quick. Look in your table on your book. Looking for the capacitance or the uh, dielectric constant of air okay, I thought I had a table in here apparently I do not. I will place that table on blackboard with various dielectric constants um. I'm going to change this problem just slightly. We'll say that the, uh, let's just say that it's a vacuum so that there is no dielectric constant. All right, so uh, the parallel plate capacitor, the area is two centimeters squared. They are separated by five millimeters. So D is five millimeters. And I want to know what is the energy stored if a 12 volt battery is applied to this capacitor. So first we need to find what is the capacitance. So we need to convert these things to SI units. Centimeter squared uh, in one meter there are 100 centimeters. We need to square this conversion factor. So that gives me 2 times 10 to the minus 4 square meters. And then 5 millimeters is 5 times 10 to the minus 3 millimeters. Uh, and so I can calculate C is epsilon naught A over D. Epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12. I was unsure of that earlier, but it is that. Uh, times 2 times 10 to the minus 4 square meters over D, which is 5 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. And that gives me the capacitance here. I get a capacitance of 3.5 times 10 to the minus 13 farads. All right, fairly small capacitor. You would express this normally in picofarads, but you won't see pico on your test. Uh, pico is 10 to the minus 12. So um, that's our capacitance. Now we want to find the energy. E is equal to 1 half CV squared. E is equal to 1 half CV squared. So that's one half of 3.5 times 10 to the minus 13 farads times um, V squared, which is 12 volts 
squared. And I get 2.5 times 10 to the minus 11 joules. Now, that's the answer for this one. Um, I made this such that instead of having air in between them, you have a vacuum. So that the with a vacuum, the dielectric constant is 1. But if you insert a substance in between two plates, that increases the uh, the capacitance of that parallel plate capacitor, as we discussed in class. And so if you insert a uh, dielectric, then you just multiply the capacitance by the dielectric factor. I think I have another problem like that in just a moment. All right, find the equivalent capacitance of the capacitors in this figure. Find the charge on each capacitor and the potential difference across it. All right, first, let's just find the equivalent capacitor. You sort of want to start with the smallest series branch or the smallest branch that's either only series or only parallel. So you see we have three branches here that are in parallel with one another. But within one of those branches, that is this one up here, you have some that are in series within that parallel branch. So our first step is just to figure out what is the equivalent of these two. And the equivalent of those two capacitors is 1 over 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2. That's 1 over 1, which is just 1. All right, so then I can replace that capacitor with just a 1 microfarad capacitor. And then I have three parallel branches that have a 1, a 1, and a 2 microfarad capacitor. So the, let me just redraw that circuit. So this is 2, 1, and 1 microfarad. And the equivalent capacitance of this circuit, when they're in parallel, you just add up the capacitances. So that's 4 microfarads. So that is the equivalent capacitance. All right, and then find the charge on each capacitor and the potential difference across it. OK, well, that's fairly easy. Um, let's take C2 first. All right, C2 has a voltage, which I'll call V2, equal to 12 volts. All right, in fact, each of these capacitors, because they're in parallel, have a voltage of 12 volts. So C1 also has a voltage of 12 volts. And then I can figure out what is Q2, because that's just C2 V2. Uh, and Q2 is um, 2 microfarads times 12 volts, which is 24 microcoulombs. All right, for C1, similarly, Q1 is equal to C1 V1 which is equal to uh, 1 microfarad times 12 volts is 12 microcoulombs. So there I've done that for uh, both of those, for C1 and C2. Now let's look at C3 and C4. I know that C3 and C4, a couple ways you can approach this, C3 and C4 are identical. So they're going to split the 12 volts that's across them. So between here and here, there are 12 volts. So I can say that V3 is equal to 12 divided by 2, which is 6 volts, because I have two capacitors that are identical splitting the same potential, which is 12 volts. So V3 and V4 are both 6 volts. And then C3, in a similar way, is Q3 times V3, which is 2 times 6, or 12 microcoulombs. And then C4 is also going to be 12 microcoulombs. Now, another way to do that is to say, what is the charge across their equivalent capacitor? So what is the charge across this capacitor? Well, I know that this charge has 12 volts. So I'm going to call this capacitor C34, all right, because it's the equivalent of capacitors 3 and 4. C34 is going to be 1 microfarad times 12 volts, which is 12 microcoulombs. So that tells me that the charge on C3, 4, the equivalent of C3 and C4 is 12 microcoulombs. 
capacitors in series have the same charge. So if this capacitor has 12 microcoulombs, that means that this capacitor and this capacitor also have 12 microcoulombs, which we found in our results down here, but we get that from a slightly different way. So if you know the, the charge on each of the capacitors, then you can find the voltage. Uh, let me correct an error down here, actually. I have C3. This should be Q3 equals C3 times V3. The numbers are right, but just the variables are wrong. Okay, so now I know the charge on the capacitor. If I know the charge and I want to know the voltage, V3, Q is equal to CV, so V is equal to Q over C. That's going to be 12 microcoulombs over uh, 2 microfarads. It's going to be 6 volts, which is what I found up here. And you do a similar thing for V4. We'll do examples like this in class, but these are good types of test questions that you'll see.